So 69 year old male undergoes a right total hip, had undergone a left one a couple of years ago, did just fine, went home on day two and was doing well until at around four weeks, actually missed a couple steps, fell down hard on his hip and presents to the eMERGE with pain and inability to weight bear in the usual sort of shortened leg, everything's okay with the incision and it hurts to move. So there's his pre-op x-rays uh, in Canada. We wait till they're really arthritic before we operate on them. You guys uh, in, the U in, my, in the U.S., Mike, that's a bone on bone hip. You might not have seen one of those in a few years actually, but that's what they look like. We, and then we go ahead and do the total hip. Everything's fine. So that's the, um, so that's the eMERGE x-rays. Okay, that's what you're dealing with. So um, let's talk about this for the next few minutes. So uh, Mike Cross, what, um, what are your thoughts? So uh, this is not atypical, I don't think. This is a pretty common thing we're seeing in the first uh, month or so after surgery. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so to me, I mean, this is like you said, is becoming a huge problem as we start moving away from cemented. And we've seen kind of a, a resurgence of uh, periprosthetic fractures with non-cemented hip replacements. I, in a routine case like this, I don't necessarily get any ESR and CRP or an infection workup. It's a good point though, because we look back at the, some of the, when I was at Rush with some of the group looking at uh, uh, complications after periprosthetic fracture, and infection rate is really high in these early uh, uh, periprosthetic fractures, but I don't routinely get an aspiration or ESR and CRP. Um, you know, the, the classification, I use the Vancouver classification. I love the Canadian classifications uh, because they actually do help guide treatment. So for this, uh, consider this a, a loose stem uh, around, around the implant. So, you know, plan would be, my personal plan is I like to um, per, do my stem preparation prior to doing the uh, fracture fixation. So I'll use, uh, prefer to use a modular taper type stem uh, distally, uh, and then uh, I can adjust my version, especially if you want to add a little bit more based on where the cup is, you know, where your stability is, uh, and then uh, cable the uh, proximal fragment back to the stem. Okay. And um, that's fantastic uh, summary. The, anybody, has, so let's, let's go back to ESR CRP. I agree, I don't get it routinely. Anybody, show of hands, would get one as a baseline? I can't see Rand. I don't know why I can only see four of you. I guess that's maybe the way I'm saying. Uh, I, I wouldn't Where get them the, the baseline. No. They had a trauma, so it should be elevated just from the trauma and the injury. Not. Perfect. Steve, so that's where the sense is there. This, when did this occur after surgery? How long? Accent. It's four weeks. <laughs> four weeks. Yeah, four I, weeks. I would. I wouldn't get a okay. second. Yeah. So consensus there for the those listening. So nobody's getting an ESR CRP. Uh, obviously, it's operative management. So. Do you, posterior approach, you're going to go back as a posterior approach. You know, we do direct laterals, at least half of us do at our place, and we go back as both posterior and direct lateral or extensile. Is anybody here a, a direct anterior operator? Hmm. So I don't, what I don't know uh, is, um, is it, can you, is it extensile enough? Can you convert this? If you're a DA guy, can you go back at four weeks and do this well through a DA, or are you going to have to use an alternative approach? Mike, do you have any insights on that, Mike Cross? Yeah, I, I think people are more and more people are trying to, to fix these from direct anterior and are getting pretty good acceptable results. I think especially if you're comfortable, if you're a primarily anterior person, to, to go back in and do it anteriorly, I think would be acceptable. I think the problem lies when you're mostly a posterior approach and they've had a previous anterior incision and you try to do it anterior. I think that's, that's where they end up seeing a lot of complications. Yeah, that's a bad day. That's a bad uh, plan to, you know, you got to go, these are tough enough cases. This one's not bad, but uh, so you, you've got to go with what you're most comfortable with. So I think all of us would go back on our own approach. If our own case is easy, if it's a partner's or you inherit it, we go back on either a posterior, no problem, or direct lateral. A DA, I must say, I, I wouldn't because I don't do them in my primary practice. So in terms of the workflow technique, Rand, um, how do you think through this? Because there's different fracture patterns, obviously. There's different bone quality, and you may not deal with them the same. Do you, do you, do you break them into a couple of groups as to what your workflow looks like? So the first thing is to extract, uh, the first thing I think I don't want to lose the choke. So that's the one thing that goes in my mind. I don't want to have somehow Excellent. the choke ex escape after I'm done with the surgery. Uh, I, I so like not to interrupt you, Rand, but I'm going to just, because I want to emphasize how important that is, you know, for the, those listening, 
even although you don't start with a trope fracture and even although the component's loose, you can inadvertently, you could fracture a trope removing a loose stem. So it's a great point. You got to protect your abductor sleeve and your trope at all costs. So excellent. Yeah. And the closer you are to the day of surgery, I think these surgeries are easy and hard in different aspects. The closer you are to the day of surgery, everything is swollen, the tissue is stiffer. And if it's your patient, it happens, uh, unfortunately, then you did a small incision and did the hip, and now you come to do this, and all of a sudden you have to extend your incision because it doesn't want to move that way, it doesn't want to turn, you don't want to break anything. So the tissue is not as easily worked with. Uh, when I come to the bone, I want to clear everything. I want to take out that stem safely, dislocate safely without causing more fractures. Uh, the thing that I'm thinking about, do I need to, uh, depends on the fracture plan, do I need to make it into an ETO? Do I just take the proximal part and I split it in half? And now it, I shell it open, I take out the stem, or it's already broken in half, and then I just make sure I don't cause more fractures. I want to deal with the distal part. I want to put a cable to protect any propagation of fractures on the distal part. Then I prepare and ream it. I use a fluted tapered stem, uh, monoblock in my hands, um, a nice Wagner three-degree taper on it. I fix it to the distal part, I range it, I see that everything is uh, good with that hip, leg length, stability, and then I just wrap those pieces back around that stem, exactly like Michael said. Uh, that's how I deal with these. The operation is pretty, I don't, I don't think it's a long upper operation to do that. Excellent, and Mike Mont, any, uh, I'll get to you Rich in a sec, any pearls of wisdom there? Yeah, I, the reason I was asking temporal is, yeah, getting the stem out at four weeks is much easier you know, if this occurred at three months, then you really would be worrying about the trochanter a lot more. You got to be much more careful. This looks reasonably stable to take this out, and it's not going to, you'll be able to get some trial in place or something, and then surclage right there uh, before necessarily putting in the final stem that bypasses this. And then you want to bypass this fracture, I guess those biomechanical studies by two and a half cortical diameters at least. I guess that's a that's a pearl. You don't want to just bypass this a little bit with your revision. Right. So, Rich, uh, you know, Mike and Rand both talked about one technique of you know fixing it distally, wrapping it around, or or first putting the proximal pieces together and then uh, prepping it as a full on two. But what are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I'm more in the, in the latter camp, I must say. It depends on the fracture pattern, obviously, but most of these will have a long spiral component, you know, that, that extends into the diaphysis. And I, in my hands, I actually like to fix that first. I fix it with a couple of cables, get a, like, as long as I can restore the tube, I find that in my hands works better. And then I actually, you know, basically prepare the stem and, and insert the stem. The reason being is that I just think I, I don't like the idea of potting this thing into this long oblique fracture because you end up with a much bigger stem than you would normally need, quite honestly, and then trying to wrap things back on again. Invariably, I can't get them back together again. So if I can restore the tube, it, you know, depending on the fracture, but I think in this case you can, I just find that's the way to go. And I, I don't have an issue with, you know, relying on the fracture to be part of my, my healing process, to be part of my stem getting in growth because these tapered stems work so well. So, sure. you know, I so would basically rich. put it back together, several cables, and then basically prepare the stem and, and insert it. If the proximal piece, the trochan or something then needs to be restored, then yes, I would deal with that. But that's sort of my approach in most of these long oblique fractures. So Rich, what if you are, res you restore the tube, like you said, and I, mm -hmm. I, I might do that sometimes, but then you feel you have to bypass it. And obviously there are different fracture yeah. patterns. Yeah, and you're getting a longer stem, and your restoration is—you uh, almost need to take those circlage wires out because you because you need well, to expand I mean, it more. Even if I restore the tube, I'm gonna I'm gonna bypass it regardless. Either way, the stem is gonna go by the the tip of the fracture by you know two 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 and a half cortical diameters. So it doesn't to me change the length of the of the construct. I mean, if if I did that and the thing started to fall apart, and obviously now then I'm gonna to have to go to plan B. I'm gonna take the cables out and then really just pot the distal piece. But I've, I've never had that happen actually. If I've been able to restore the cortical tube, you know, in, in a stable manner and it's not comminuted, which it usually isn't, I've been able to just basically work work through that. And in my hands, it works, you know, it's worked well. So that's, that's kind of my plan A in this type of fracture pattern. 
Great. And uh, I think we're all agreeing that these fractures are certainly not rare. And of the things increasing, if you will, uh, this, is a, this is a thing that we see more than we would have seen uh, 10 or 15 years ago, not less. So I agree, Mike, uh, we use a Vancouver classification. I think everybody kind of does B2 or way by far the most common fracture pattern um, with the stems being loose. So interoperatively, uh, do you guys do interoperative radiographs, uh, Ram? Um, no, I, I don't do radiographs unless I, I have concerns that I'm not in the canal or I, I'm feeling uncomfortable with my leg length. Not routinely. Okay. So, so with a fracture, it's kind of, if you miss the canal and the fracture, then uh, you, you probably should go back to dermatology school or something, I'm <laughs> guessing. Not likely going to happen. Um, Mike, do you get interoperative films to check things or kind of hit and miss depending on the case? I don't, get, I don't get these type of radiographs. I would get, I would bring my fluoro into the room because I want to be able to, I want to be able to do this, rotate the hip. Yeah. Depending on the fractures, that's what I want in the room for these cases. Rich? Uh, I'm an x-ray guy. More, more information, the better. X-ray or fluoro, but I like to just leave the room knowing what, what it's going to look like. So yeah, I'm a fan of it. And I got to say, I, I routinely, um, I'm, the, I'm not rich, as you know, like I don't do a lot of interoperative right. radiographs. I tend to, um, occasionally I will, but not as routine. Yeah. So uh, that's what was done. So philosophically, uh, who would be monoblock and who would be modular? So if I, I'm going to go out, I'll do, I'll do monoblock, Rich. Yeah, monoblock. I haven't done a modular stem for uh, three and a half years. So Mike Cross and Mike Mott with Cross. I'm modular. I'd like yeah. to agree with you, Steve, on everything, but not, not this case. I'm, I'm modular on these type of cases. Just yeah, but Mike's agree. Yeah, modular. Modular, modular, and Ram? I'm uh, monoblock like you two. Well, then three to two, we win. Sorry, Mike, you guys are out. <laughs> it is. It's all that issue. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you one thing. Apparently, in America, I have troubles counting votes, but I'm no. I, I'm Canadian, and that's three two. And <laughs> in our country, our country, you win with that. Actually, yeah. uh, I don't want to cause an international incident. <laughs> I'll move on. Um, so, early postoperative periprosthetic fractures, causes and prevention. I think you know when I think about it, it's kind of I. It's either one or two for me. So either. Uh, it's a fall like this case where the patient was functioning well, and I think it's a new fracture. And these implants, let's face it, they're like little axes. And if you actually load like a piece of wood, you're going to get a fracture. But I do think a number of them are simply um, missed or unrecognized interoperative fractures. And, uh, and I think that's any approach can get it. Um, but a propagation of an unrecognized fracture. And that might be one you see a little bit earlier on, you know, it's a week or two or three. And often they don't have the trauma. It obviously they describe acute pain, but it's not like they've had to do a lot to get that. And I think that's probably a, a missed fracture that we just haven't, haven't seen. It is more common in the DA approach. There's series, it's a wee bit controversial, but not really because big registry data supports that. It doesn't mean you don't do the DA approach. It just means it's a slightly higher fracture rate. Would anybody disagree with that on the phone? No. No, that's good. I, I don't have control of to mute everybody, but if they did, I'd <laughs> not forward. Um, but it's, it's, and it's slightly, like it's a slight bit different. And then also I think poor bone stock in the elderly with cementless fixation. So at our institution, you know, we still do a lot of hip fractures here at, at University Hospital. And we teach, we use a bipolar, but um, we do cemented stems for the most part, unless somebody's you know, young, active, and maybe do a total hip. Um, Mike, you mentioned this, I think, Cross, about uh, elderly patients. So what's your plan in a, in a hip fracture case? When do you mainly cement those cases still? Yeah, hip fracture, I still cement. You know, I think the data is still good for femoral neck fractures. The best, the best results with cemented femoral fixation. I've actually, you know, I've seen a trend to go back more towards cement in my personal practice is that the more, you know, periprosthetic fractures I see in individuals over 75, you know, to me, you know, I know that 75 year old with the cemented stem is probably going to last in the rest of their life. So I've probably made more of a switch back towards cement than, than I used to maybe five years ago, even so. That's great. And I know most of the audience obviously listening in is U.S. based, but around the world, I mean, the U.S. probably puts in more cementless femoral 
fixation at just about any place, quite frankly. And if you look at global registry, so Australia's fantastic, the UK is fantastic, some of the Scandinavian, no question once you, it's actually 65, but for sure you can make it once you hit 75, the revision rate is higher if you do some atlas. Now, if you, if you're selective and you take the right bone stock, I think you get away, you know, that's not a truism for all, but there's certainly a trend. Mike Mont, uh, you got your chance now to finally agree with me or maybe disagree again. I don't know. Have to do it again. No, I'm, I do cementless on everybody. I, I think, yeah, you, you know, I'm so comfortable with that, that, that why would I go to a cemented? And I think that's probably the lesson. If you're very comfortable uh, and you're used to that, that that's the way you go. But what you said is absolutely correct. So I'll agree with you on that. The trend now is that people over 60, 65 are getting much better results for cemented than cement. And do you still do fracture care, Mike? I still do. do. Unfortunately, really? they punt them to me. They- I think that's the majority of the hip society in the United States. Yeah. I, I, still I, 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 Even though what you said about the data is correct, a lot of the studies. So I'm going to agree with you there. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so t- treatment of early... <laughs> Uh, post-op parapresthetic fractures, technical points. So almost always a B2, as we mentioned. Uh, talked already about the approach. You're going to need a larger incision, as Rand mentioned. Longer stem, obviously, than the primary. You can bypass that to get distal fixation again, as uh, as Mike Mont mentioned. I, I tend to work through the fracture, and uh, although Rand mentioned perhaps having to do an ETO, I think that would be a, a sort of incredibly a, a rare situation, some odd duck uh, going on there. So put the thing together, clamp, bone holding clamp or rebruge we use here, uh, remove the stem, and again, protect those abductors in the GT fragment. And then we talked about the two options, fix the fracture first, cable cerclage, I think both for uh, Rich and I, that's our preference, or prepare the distal femur and do the wraparound technique. And again, you can do the, fix the fracture first if the bone quality is good, and the fracture is amenable to that, and the reconstituted femur is going to provide fixation. And if not, then poor bone quality. I think we're all doing the same thing, where we pot it distally and then take the fragments proximally and wrap it around the best we can. Um, and then regardless of technique, I, I think Grand mentioned it, just put a cable just uh, below that fracture so you try not to extend it. There'll be cases where poor bone quality as you're putting in the stem you actually see a fracture and you see it start to propagate you wrap another cable and you propagate and it just it, it is what it is that does happen sometimes as long as you recognize it and i don't really chase that liner um particularly because these are usually early fractures on the ones i'm talking about so then those have been around a while with gray hair we grew up in the era of cylindrical stems not tapered stems there's been a good data now though one good series out of vancouver another out of the mayo clinic and really both studies showing excellent short to midterm results with a, a titanium fluted stem. In these cases, they were modular. Uh, these are publications from a few years back. And another one showing, again, from Mayo Clinic, demonstrating that even if they subside a little bit early on in these periprosthetic fractures, they do stabilize in that position, not resulting in necessitating uh, any further surgery. So to summary, uh, almost all are B2, require vision with a longer cementless stem. And I think all of us are now using titanium taper fluted stems. And uh, you heard earlier that um, the more intelligent of the panel is doing monoblock and a couple <laughs> guys are struggling still with the modular. Um, but really that tends to be the way we're treating these. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. That was a great case, a great discussion. You know, I think one other point I wanted to bring up, too, is that, that if you're going to do a modular stem and fix the tube first, you have to be careful that you don't, that you get your modular junction seated. A lot of times it pushes you so lateral that it's hard to get that modular piece in and make sure it's fully seated before you screw it in if you're fixing the fracture first. So great, great discussion.